Good afternoon, my name is Corinne Smith and my project was over Harriet Jacobs. So the first thing we are going to talk about is the early life of Harriet Jacobs. She had a decently happy childhood. Um, she was born into slavery in 1813 in Edenton, North Carolina. And she didn't know she was a slave until her parents passed away and she overheard a conversation. Her father was a carpenter and his money allowed for the family to live comfortably together in a home. So that's how she didn't know that she was a slave. But her father was owned by someone and her mother was owned by a different master. Harriet became an orphan at a young age. Her mother died when she was six and her father when she was 11. Harriet Jacobs was sent to live with her grandmother and a white mistress upon the death of her mother. And once upon the death of her white mistress, she was given to her mistress's niece, Mary Norkin. Mary Norkin, the niece, was only three years old at that time. So her father, Dr. James Norkin, became her master and was the cause of a great deal of misery for Jacobs. Next is adolescence. Around the age of 15, Dr. Norkin made many efforts to bend Harriet's will. These included sexual advancement towards Harriet, sexual abuse, whispering of foul words in her ears, and relentless pursuit. Harriet entered a liaison with a white lawyer, Samuel Sawyer, and had two children with him by the age of 20, after Dr. Norkin forbade her from marrying a black freed slave that was a carpenter. Her first child that she had was Louisa Jacobs, which is in the left, in the, excuse me, the right hand corner. And her second child was Joseph, which is in the top left corner. She learned that Norkin was preparing to have her children be plantation slaves, like he did with her after he found out that she had children with Samuel Sawyer. And to protect them, she ran away. In June of 1835, she knew if she left that her children would remain with her grandmother, avoiding the brutalities of plantation slavery. Later in life, when Harriet ran away, she hid in her grandmother's garret or crawl space above the porch. She lived there for seven years, keeping watch over her children through a hole she drilled in the wall, sewing and reading the Bible. The crawl space was seven feet wide and nine feet long with no light or ventilation. There was mice and rats in the crawl space as well, and she couldn't even stand up. Samuel Sawyer purchased their two children, and in, four, in 1842, she made her escape to freedom. She sailed to Philadelphia and then traveled to New York City by train, where she was reunited with her daughter. She lived in constant fear of being caught by Dr. Norkin. In New York City, she became involved with the abolitionists associated with Frederick Douglass's paper, The North Star. She was freed in 1852 by Cornelia Willis. Cornelia Willis arranged for the purchase of Harriet and then freed her. There is in the neighborhood a young colored carpenter, a freeborn man. We've known each other since childhood and we frequently meet together. Oh, we become mutually attached, and he proposes to marry me. Oh, I love him. But when I think that I am a slave, and that the laws give no sanction to a marriage as such, oh, my heart just sinks within me. My love, he, he wants to buy me, but I know that Dr. Flint is too, too willful and arbitrary a man to consent to that arrangement. When Dr. Flint learns of my wish to be married, he summons me. So, you want to be married, do you, and do a free nigger? Yes, sir. Well, I'll soon show you whether I'm your master or that nigger fellow you honor so highly. If you must have a husband, you may take up with one of my slaves. Well, don't you suppose, sir, that a slave can have some preference about marrying? Do you suppose that all men are alike to her? Do you love this nigger? Yes, sir. How dare you tell me so? <gasps> he, he springs upon me like a tiger and gives me a stunning blow. It is the first time he has ever struck me and my fear does not enable me to control my anger. You have struck me for answering me, you honestly. I would despise you. Do you know what you have just said? Yes, sir. 
But your treatment drove me to it. Do you know that I have the right to do as I like with you? That I can kill you if I please. You have already tried to kill me and I wish you had. But you have no right to do as you like with me. Silence! Ah, oh, heavens, girl, you forget yourself too far. Are you mad? If you are, I will soon bring you to your senses. Do you think any other master would have borne what I have borne from you this morning? Many masters would have killed you on the spot. How would you like to be sent to jail for your insolence? I, I know I have been disrespectful, sir, but you drove me to it. I couldn't help it. As far as jail is concerned, there would be more peace for me there than there is here. Well, you deserve to go there. But I am not ready to send you there yet. There's no hope that the doctor will ever consent to sell me. He has an iron will and he's determined to keep me and to conquer me. My love, he's an intelligent and religious man. Even if he can't obtain permission to marry me while I'm a slave, the laws will give him no power to protect me from my master. Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl Written by Herself by Harriet Jacobs This is Harriet Jacobs' first and ever novel, which is an autobiography that was published in 1861. She was encouraged by the success of Harriet Beecher's novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin. The book came out under the episodium of Linda Brent, a fictitious name. With this narrative, Jacobs not only wanted to reveal the horrors of slavery, but also the problems faced by female slaves, sexual abuse, and slave mothers who were separated from their children. Jacobs insists, I had no motive for secrecy on my own account. In her preface, she says, given the harrowing and sensational story she had to tell, the one-time fugitive felt she had little alternative but to shield herself from a readership whose understanding and empathy she could not take for granted. Next is the summary of the novel. The novel starts out with Harriet Jacobs expressing her reasons for writing the novel. She says that her story is painful and she would rather keep it quiet, but she believes sharing it will help the anti-slavery movement. Linda Brent, a slave girl, lives a comfortable life up until her parents pass. Once an orphan, her mother's white mistress passes away, and she is given to the Flint family. Dr. Flint made sexual advances towards Brent for many years, even after she had sexual relationships with the white lawyer, Mr. Sands, and had two children, Benny and Ellen. Dr. Flint is mad at Linda, so he sends her to a plantation, and Linda finds out that he is going to subject her children to the same fate. That is when she plans to escape. She hides in a crawl space above her grandmother's porch for seven years, constantly writing letters to throw Dr. Flint off of her location. Linda finally escapes to the north by boat and is reunited with Ellen and Benny, and in the end is sold to Miss Bruce. The major themes of the novel were psychological abuses of slavery, domesticity slash motherhood, the inhumanity of slavery, and the perils of slavery for women. The psychological abuses of slavery. Jacobs does not ignore such issues, but her focus on slaves' mental and spiritual anguish makes an important contribution to the genre. As a slave with a relatively easy, quote unquote, easy life, Linda does not have to endure constant beatings and hard physical labor, but she and many of the other slaves around her suffer greatly from being denied basic human rights and legal protection. Second, domesticity and motherhood. The value of motherhood is one of Jacob's most salient themes. Harriet may not have wanted children for fear of them being caught in slavery's clutches, but her devotion to her children is overwhelmingly fierce. Everything she does is for their sake. Her running away from Dr. Flint, her years of discomfort, pain, and loneliness in the crawl space, her treacherous escape to the north, and her wage labor in New York. Linda's greatest dream was creating a home for herself and her children. Third, the inhumanity of slavery. Jacob emphasizes many times in the novel that slavery dehumanizes masters along with the slaves they oppress. Her book is also valuable in that it speaks to another problem with slavery. It is just as corrupting for white people. Indeed, the entire South and even the North were affected by the cancer of slavery. Slave masters were... Listen, and vicious, and their wives were jealous and vindictive. 
Children of slave owners learned too early about violence and sex, and as they aged, they became indoctrinated into their parents' system. Last one is the perils of slavery for women. Women found that their bodies were not their own. They were sexual objects. Many were made to bear the children of their white masters, all the while being deprived of marriage to the men that they would choose for themselves. Any child born to a slave woman would also be a slave, no matter the position of the father. Harriet Jacobs' Autobiography and Contribution to African American Literature and History Harriet Jacobs was the first woman to write a fugitive slave narrative in the United States. Her novel was one of the first open discussions about the sexual harassment and abuse endured by slave women, normally a topic that even made many abolitionists uncomfortable. The novel addresses white women of the North on behalf of thousands of slave mothers that are still in bondage in the South. White abolitionist propaganda in the antebellum era only rarely discussed how slave women resisted sexual exploitation. Harry Jacobs also had to consider how to write the novel so that white women would not be offended or take or become defensive when reading it, but instead share and accept the novel as reality. Thank you for listening to my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it.